full view. Um, okay, so for those of you new to TechRise, I am Desiree Vargas Wrigley, our executive director. I think we need you to mute too with Brand Week. Okay, so I am the executive director of TechRise and two-time Latina founder here in Chicago. I'm my first company, Give Forward, and my second company, Parachute. And um, for those of you unfamiliar with TechRise, we are a um, an organization or initiative in partnership with Verizon that is designed to help um, Black and Latinx founders in Chicago, all the way from idea stage to exit. And so every week we bring together three to five idea to seed stage founders to pitch their businesses in front of a panel of judges. And they get about three minutes to pitch their businesses, followed by Q&A from each judge. And then the judges deliberate real time here and decide who will win $20,000 to $50,000. This week it's a $20,000 prize. So stay tuned and stay till the end of the hour because that is when the really exciting part happens. Um, and before we start talking about our judges, I do want to take a second to just talk about how important this moment is. Um, you know, our city has nearly 30% Black, 30% Latinx, and 30% white representation. And yet our funding ecosystem only puts 1.9% of funding into our Black and Latinx communities. So we have a lot of work to do. And TechRise is just the beginning of one of many initiatives around the, the city. And so each week we bring people in to come and talk about what work is happening around the city and actually around the country. And so we're excited to talk more about that during deliberation. But I also wanted to just mention that Latinx founders make up 15% of businesses in this country. They own over 350,000 businesses across the US and have created three million, over 3 million jobs. But only 3% of those companies ever do over a million dollars in revenue, which just shows how much lack of scale there is, but also how much opportunity there is. And so at TechRise, we're focused on traditional tech companies that you would think of like, you know, the next Facebook, but we're also thinking about how can we, you know, add technology to existing businesses to help them scale and grow, creating generational wealth and hopefully narrowing the wealth gap across all of our populations here. So I just want to remind everyone that for some of these founders, it's going to be the first time they've ever pitched to any judges or investors. And some of them might be a little bit nervous and some of them will be incredibly polished, but really it's about celebrating the fact that they took the courage to come on stage and share their bold visions with us. And we are, we couldn't be more thrilled. So I would love to encourage you all to please come to the TechRise community and offer to mentor or fund or connect any of these founders. You can do that by going to techrise.co. And then of course you can always support with your dollars. So we have a $5 million fund that we are raising over three years. We're pretty, we're doing great. We're at a great clip so far, but soon we'll be able to make the base prize money every week, $25,000. And you can help with that by going to techrise.co slash donate. All right. And now I am excited to introduce our wonderful judges. Um, first, we have Marcos Gonzalez. He is the founder and managing partner of Vamos Ventures. Marcos, if you want to come on camera on, we'd love to see you. Um, and just you can wave hello. Um, so Vamos Ventures is a $50 million early stage fund that invests in tech companies led by Latinx and diverse teams. Previously, Marcos worked in private equity, strategy consulting, and was a tech entrepreneur in the early internet days. Um, he's the son of Mexican immigrant parents, went to Brown for undergrad, Harvard for business school. You're based in LA, um, but you invest all over the country, correct? Great. And the investment size is 250 to a million dollars, which is super important for that early stage because that means you guys lead rounds. So great, so wonderful exactly. to have you. Thank you. Great. Okay, and next um, we have Pedro Sostre. He is co-founder and CEO of Navigate, and he's an entrepreneur and author in the tech and e-commerce space. He's driven over $100 million in revenue for early stage startups after his last exit, which congratulations. Um, so sorry, since his last exit, he shifted his focus to helping under-supported founders at the earliest stages. And in the past three years, he's helped hundreds of founders through personal mentoring, um, helping lead innovation startups for WeWork and now through Navigate in Miami. So welcome. Miami has taken some of our best founders. And so we're hoping, you know, Miami and LA can become sister cities for us. And we can, you know, you guys can come here during the summer. We'll come there during the winter. It'll be Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And then I'm thrilled to introduce our final judge, Stephanie Diaz, um, partner at Zane Venture Fund. Welcome. Um, and chair of the board for Zane Access Stephanie has been listed as one of 39 Atlanta female leaders to follow by Startup Sisters um, and has 15 years of experience spanning marketing, entrepreneurship, 
and investor relations. You also host a podcast, which, what is it called? She Conquers Capital. Oh, awesome. So everyone tune into that, please. Um, And that's where she amplifies the voices of diverse female CEOs, venture partners, and angel investors. So welcome. We're so excited to have you all. And I will um, ask you to go uh, video off and camera and and mute until we get to um, the Q&A with our first founder. And I'm excited to introduce Javier Otero um, from Future House. Hello. Hello. Okay, I'm going to share the screen and you'll let me know. I don't have controls though. We will fix that right now. Thank you. And by we, I mean the host who is not me, but someone. (laughs) Some magical button and I'm still waiting. Okay, don't worry. We'll reset the timer um, and just, uh, you know, I think you got it. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I've got stuff. Great. If we can bring the timer back, wonderful. If not, I will run it for you. So you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, ready to go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Javier Otero. I began my career in the tech industry nearly 20 years ago. And when I say this, people look at me and wonder, how old was he when he started? And even though my curiosity in technology began at a young age, my career didn't start when I was five. But one thing that remained constant throughout the years was that any time I would walk into a room, I was often the only person that looked like me. I always struggled to be included in conversations and be heard. So I sat back, I listened, observed, and learned. I developed my own approach. Five years ago, I was hired by a product development company to lead a team. This was my first chance to put my process to the test. And it worked, it became successful. In one year, I brought in over 6 million in revenue. At that time, our C-level leadership was looking for a CTO. When I asked one of the partners if I could move into that position, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, I don't even know what that would look like. That's when I wondered, is it because he didn't, couldn't see someone that looked like me in that position? At that moment, I knew it was time to leave and lean into my own company. So I found a future house, a design and technology studio that creates digital products. You might be saying to yourself, don't we have enough agencies and dev shops? Why do we need another one? Future House was designed to flip the agency model on its head and truly change the industry. Startups and nonprofits need technology more than ever. And four key things they always struggle with are how to match their idea to the right technology and bring it to life, how to hire designers and engineers when they don't have the background, how to find agencies to cultivate their ability to grow their own, and how to give products the constant attention and iteration they need to be successful. The agency model doesn't allow clients to be nimble. Future House solves that. This is what separates us from all our competition, our four-step process. We validate ideas, we help clients develop and launch it, we build their own team, and we phase out over time. We bring and integrate tech thoughtfully into your company. With our model, our clients can focus on their ideas and ability to adapt while being ready for the long term. Startups and nonprofit spending on technology is only going up, and the market has a lot to spend in technology, but fixing mistakes eats into innovation. That's why it's important to invest in your ideas wisely. Future House is bootstrapped since we began in 2010. To date, all of our work has come from referrals and we spent very little on marketing. In order to acquire more clients, we plan to go after three key areas. Elevate our authority in the industry, help people understand our model through content marketing, closely track our our CPA LTV per channel and adapt to that. In the next three years, we plan to be a $3 million a year company by making our approach more accessible and automatable. Our unique process is powered by templates and repeatable structure. With your support, we'll carve time to go from pure services studio to a services plus plus platform company. Throughout the past 20 years, I reverse engineered a wealth of business design and technology skills that have allowed me to be a part of and run successful teams. I built a strong network that we tap into regularly to build world-class teams. And my reputation has led to all the work and referrals we have to date. By investing in us, you're investing in, the other, in other founders' dreams. We'll deliver the process and diverse teams to make ideas possible for others. Help us show the industry what this really looks like and bring innovation within reach. Thank you. Great, and now if the judges could come uh, camera on and everyone unmute, including you, Javier, um, so everyone can answer questions and... Hi, Javier. Great job. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about your pricing model, especially considering your target market being startups and nonprofits. 
Yeah, that's a fair question. So it is uh, an hourly based but fixed model. Uh, so we do provide fixed costs with guaranteed uh, measurable results that we uh, identify when we first start meeting with our clients. So we don't jump in and just have an ambiguous end point. We make sure that there is a, a point that we can get to and we provide uh, that uh, fixed value. And that cost is actually something that we've worked really hard with the process because it's so, you know, we, we've cleared out a lot of the gaps between that to make it very efficient. So that helps reduce a lot of that. And I also have a strong network that I built rapport with over time and they come in and you know that's another aspect that I've been able to build those relationships they care a lot about the clients we work with and so we also provide some specialty pricing uh, depending on the different clients that we work with perfect thank you I have a couple of questions um, can you tell me a little bit about the team um, outside of you of course. Yeah. So there's me. Uh, we also have a director of account management. She has about 12 years worth of experience and she's worked in a lot of different areas uh, when it comes to consulting and startups and a lot of that. The other factor that we uh, go into is we have a network of contractors. So uh, we, it's about 30 ish or so, and they range in uh, their abilities quite widely. The reason we do that is because when we determine what the approach is and what the fixed costs look like, we also stay agnostic to what the solution should be. So we that's another big challenge with a lot of uh, companies in our case. And one thing we are remote, so that's something that also reduces um, the overall cost of overhead for the staff, for the team that we provide, but we're able to uh, work with people to do that. And obviously the other side is when we work with clients in many cases, we work with them to bring in their own talent when we go into the project. So the recruiting sometimes happens between the design and technology phase, and then we shift and we actually build alongside them and we train them how to do it. And then we say, hey, we'll see you later. So that's uh, hopefully that answers your question, Pedro. Thank you. Great. Javier, thank you for being here and for presenting and doing your thing. It's not easy. And so congrats on that. Um, my, my question is related to go to market strategy. Any company that's early stage needs to think about how they're going to get to market and create a beachhead. In, in an industry like yours and what you're doing, it's super competitive. And so I, I'd like to understand kind of how you're going to differentiate yourself or how you're already doing that. And if you're focusing on a particular part of uh, a, a single industry or a subsector of an industry and what your focus is uh, around that. And, and then well, basically that's, that's the question around go to market. If you would have your thanks. Yeah. Oh, th thank you, Marcos. So I'll talk to the um, target audience first, right? We talked a little about startups and nonprofits. There's a lot of experience I have there and a lot of connections I have within that industry um, that have helped us cultivate a lot of our clients to date. So that's one aspect that helps us um, work with people. Now, I'm beginning to lose a little bit of my train of thought because I want to answer the other question, which is when we work with them, and forgive me, that's talk. all right. That's all right, Javier. I was asking about the go-to-market strategy. It's a very competitive place, very competitive field. Thank you. How do you differentiate yourself? Yeah. From, from this? So one is uh, I started Future House in 2010. Uh, that makes us actually within the city of Chicago, and I've still been doing a lot of this research, but we are one of the first minority-owned firms of this kind. We provide full service from branding to design to technology, and that actually gives us a unique vantage point because a lot of people are looking for diverse companies that are led that way. And we also bring in diverse teams. So one of the things we solve for is when people are looking to make sure that their companies are able to you know, hit their ideas running, the challenge that they have is there's a limited tech, uh, talent, the tech pool. It's hard to find. You have a limited amount of time to you know, verify all these candidates are coming in. And we help people, uh, we then sort through that to make sure they're able to do it. Wonderful job, Javier. Now it's time for us to go on to our next competitor and we're going, thank you so much. Good job, everyone can go camera off and we are going to introduce um, Seven Cubes and Polly Ramirez. We're ready for you when you are. Hi, I'm Polly Ramirez, and this is Seven Cubes. This is me at three years old. 
I want you to focus on a dress I'm wearing and imagine a mother raising five kids and running a dress shop. As an entrepreneur, can you think of my mom's number one problem? Like many business owners, my mom's biggest challenge was struggling between clientele, training staff, booking meetings, and having a time for little Polly and maybe my four other siblings, but who cares about them? Now, if you had technology for her competitors, it would be pretty difficult for my mom's manual business to compete. That was my mom's story, but do you know how many small businesses are out there facing the same problems my mom did? There are 30 million small businesses in the United States alone, and roughly 80% of those are not being served by the inaccessibility of technology available for them. Many struggle between navigating between different subscription options, need to spend extra time learning new technology processes, or integrating through the system can be very expensive. Our solution for small business is fairly simple. It is based on four principles, create an affordable, user-friendly, centralized ERP system around a community. Small business consolidate all their daily tasks into one system like billing, accounting, social media scheduling, video calling, and more features. We know software isn't the only issue that's plaguing small business growth. We also want to focus on supporting and building the community. This is apart from all competitors in the market. Our community is a mobile professional app complementing our technology platform. We utilize a matching algorithm to provide our members with optimal matches and resources to their needs. What's being offered in the market is ways too expensive and difficult to use for use for a small business. For example, one of our closest competitors, Uru, offers to lower their customer with the cheap subscriptions, but once the customer picks all their items, they're giving a really expensive price tag. As for Salesforce, I'm sure one of you has an experience with Salesforce. Their overwhelming features, certification to be an expat, can be pretty overwhelming, especially for a small business owner. We offer three tier memberships starting at $100 a month for an annual subscription. Currently, we have 100 customers in flight for our launch and one prepaid subscription. We also have a white label platform where companies can set up their B2B. Unlike competitors who spend a huge amount of their budget on traditional advertising, we offer a mobile community app, thus creating member loyalty organic growth, which reduces the cost of member acquisition. That enables us to create value for our members as a result, making it super difficult for businesses to replicate our business model. We also have partnership with ICC, Amalimita, and others listed here. We're targeting 5% of the current 31 million small business segment for the next five years. We projected our current pricing will reach 450 million in the next five years at a 7% profit margin, which aligns with the market norm. We are on par for a beta launch and we'll continue with our development as showing our milestones. We know there are many ideas in the market, but what makes us good is great team executing. We know that you are investing in us as much as you're investing in our business. We have a combined experience of 25 years in software development, IT surgical operation, planning, data management, product development, and community building. Thank you. Great, and we'll welcome the judges back on. And your co-founder. This is Chase, my CEO. Hi, guys. We got a really, really good pitch. A um, couple of, uh, actually, you answered one of my questions during the pitch. Good job. Um, the other question, I thought, I thought I heard you mention some number of customers, but then I, I heard you say you're coming out of beta. I was just wondering who's who's using the system. Is it live? Yes. Do you have a so going on. Yes. So we are doing pre-sale of memberships. So we have one sole pre-membership right now, but we have a hundred customers who are waiting for us to launch. Uh, they're signed up for it for the pre-launch. Stephanie or Marcos, you want to ask yeah. a question? Um, Polly, great job. What a bold idea to, you know, to bring all of these platforms together into one solution. No small task. So I commend you for going for it. What I would love to know, though, is kind of, you know, to, to follow on to Pedro's question, with these early adopters, the ones who have expressed interest, is there an element that they are more interested in? Is it the social media? Is it the inventory track? You know, like what element of the tech offering do you see them being more tuned into? It all depends on what they're doing. So we have particularly 
one of our like so acupuncturists who's running a small business uh her issue right now is develop, trying to deal with all the paperwork so she's kind of more interested in the, in the fact that she could put everything in one place and all the paperwork right there with her without her having to do it manually um there's also the digital people who are like freelancers who need a lot of help with their clients for like social media instead of like our competition like later they can only have one account they can have as many as accounts that they have on their end and track everything right there so it depends on mainly the industry since we that's why we created like a, like a huge software where like we only put the basic of one you need. And then depending on the business, they can like customize it a little bit to their needs. Uh, you kind of notice right there, like it's very user friendly and like very approachable for them. Also, may I add something? Um, we also added analytics and data integrations. That is something that a lot of businesses are needing. And many, many um, softwares that they don't own the they, they don't own the data. They just have a whole bunch of data or in Excel or Google Doc. What we offer is analytic automations and um, and quite a few uh, features that most places do not offer, like inventory management, supply chain management. So those are the things that we actually saw manufacturing is one area where they need the ERP, but they cannot afford it. A lot of small mom and pop shops, they use paper, they use books, they use notebooks, and they use their kids to memorize things for them. We, we, <laughs> we have done surveys, we ask questions, we're like, wait a second, this is very inefficient. How do you guys go through it with 20 years? And then that's what happened when pandemic hits. A lot of that fell through and then they were having troubles going through their inventories, doing um, their customers' relationships and all of that. So we know that with a lot of small businesses, they're lacking a lot of the automations, a lot of processes and with the data, analytics, analytics, analytics. And we make it so simple that they can they don't even need to learn anything, just like submit the data and we'll run some of the AI algorithms, some of the processes for them. And that's what we offered. Great. So I just want to make sure we have room for one more question from Marcos. That, that, I appreciate that, Chase. Um, that's interesting. Actually, my question was around product and product development and management. When you're starting out, you have 100 companies that are waiting to do this. That's, that's awesome. It's great learning experience. It, do you have, what's your product development process to ensure that you're focusing on the key areas of value and you don't end up with another sales force that can do everything for anyone and is just overwhelming? Yes, I agree with you with that part. I use Salesforce before. I think most of us in most you know corporates use Salesforce or individual integrated service. Um, the re the, our development um, process is very agile. We listen to our consumers. That's why we have the community hub. That's the most important thing that a lot of ERPs and softwares are not focusing on. I build you features, I keep adding features, I keep giving you more. But what is that more is confusing and it's disruptive and it costs and it costs you time and money and your resources spend too much time on learning and never remember how to use it. What we are doing is listening to our customers. Sorry, we're at time. I'm sorry if I cut you off. That's the but all right. Um, hopefully you can follow up with them after Thank you. over LinkedIn or something else. But um, great job, um, Polly and Chase. Thanks for coming on. And um, they, um, you're already giving the judges a lot to think about. So thank you. All right. Um, well, next, I am thrilled to invite Route to the stage. And we have Ricardo Regalado joining us from, you're in Miami, I think, right? But normally here. I've been in Miami all week. Uh, <laughs> I'm at the fountain right now. We just, yeah. Great. Well, we're excited to hear all about it. You can start whenever you're ready. All right. One second. Do you want to just start without presentation and just yeah, well, go into I it? Got it here. Hold on. What just happened? All right. You guys see it? Not yet. All right. Good. Sounds like it looks like you're going now. So good. All right. Are you guys able to see it? We can, yeah, go ahead. All right, cool. Sorry about that. All right, guys, so Route. Route is a two-sided marketplace, but I'm doing it with a little bit of a twist, right? Uh, it's a two-sided marketplace.
place in the facility services industry where we focus on the service vendor first. So when I say service vendor, think of like a cleaning company, a maintenance company, uh, handyman services, plumbing, and so forth. So that industry is, it, let's talk about commercial cleaning first. The industry is very fragmented itself, right? I personally know this because I come from the space. Uh, small business owners to the large enterprise contractor, huge uh, up you know, uh, level from one to the other. And it's because a small business owner is wearing so many hats, right? They're, they're, they're tasked to do sales, they're tasked to build and cultivate client relationships, Q, QC, manage invoicing, hire. It, I mean, it's crazy. And again, I know this because I, I, I've been in those shoes. So what we wanted to do was create a platform that solves not just for the general business ecosystem and the business management, but but for the niche, for that space, because it's you know there's not one solution that can serve serve all and solve all. So with our 1.0 that I went to market with already, we focused on sales first. We built sales tools because that was my aha moment when I was in the business that if I don't get the stuff out of my head, I'm never going to scale and grow my business. Uh, it's a pen and paper industry. The you know the commercial cleaning. You know this entire presentation will be focused on cleaning because that's my core competency. Uh, you know, a lot of the industry underbids. A lot of the industry has pro problems delivering proposals in time. Uh, their sales operations, it's completely unorganized uh, because they're wearing so many hats, right? So you might, you're like, you know, Rick, why did you pick cleaning? Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, my name is Ricky Reglato. I come from the industry. I have built a cleaning company that is now evolved into a facilities management company from zero to 10 million. Inc. 5,000, three years in a row. I built credibility in the space. I, I host a podcast and I share cleaning company stories. My team, the company was incubated in the Rose Auto office. So the team here, like you see Joe, you see Greg, these are part of my founding team. They live and breathe the industry because they see it. They live the pain points. They deal with it. They perform cleaning tasks. Uh, they know what it is to own a cleaning business. Our phase one, as you see it here, uh, 1.0 was the sales tools. So we digitized the walkthrough, we digitized the bidding calculator, and we digitized the proposal generation. Yes, some of those exist, but we were the first to market that created the, the connection between all three to make it super simple, right? Think of the ability to quote a job in another state. We've given contractors that ability because we've digitized that process. So by listening to them, though, we knew right away, too, we're, you know, my, I knew they were going to want more. So as we're launching 2.0, which is what I'm pitching to you guys today and what I'm trying to raise funds for, is we, we dealt with the sales tools. Now we're expanding on that. We're, we want to do, you know, we said, hey, what, what, uh, why not close the sale with collecting payment? And we wanted to be more of a sticky solution. So with 2.0, we're incorporating uh, payments, invoicing, management. But on top of that, we also, on the front end, are, we created a CRM to enhance the sales process. And then last but not least, we also partnered with Home Depot, which I'll show you in the next slide. And we partnered with Home Depot for the supply ordering process because it is that is the number one line item that if a contractor gets it right and orders and is able to buy supplies like a larger company, they're going to increase their bottom line by one to 2%. Again, I live it, I know it, it, it happened to me. But the current GPOs that are out there only solve the large business. I want to solve the minority owned business, the women owned business, the under 2 million in revenue business. So we're going to be the first TPO to get set. It's time for questions. So got to go. Okay. Go for it. All right. Let's bring the judges on. Great pitch. I would love to know, um, you know, considering your target market and you mentioned that it is a fragmented industry, what is your go to market strategy? How are you planning to get in front of them? Yeah. So right now we have 200 customers uh, throughout the, on the globe, right? We have customers in Bermuda, uh, Chile, Argentina, Europe, just because our content is that great. Um, you know, when you search tools on, on the internet, our tools, one of the first that pops up. So we've got a podcast that we've been producing for the last year. We, you know, again, we're empowering the space and have, have, have credibility, but now we have credibility where it's, they trust our technology. They see the content we're busting out. We've got a YouTube channel, not just the how to stuff, but like, look at, this is a tool being used in real life. Here's Home Depot sitting down right here next to me talking about the GPO program that we're gonna build. So I'm putting a face to the solution that we're building and I'm showing the small business owners, this can happen. I was there. I was, I cleaned with my wife 
just us two, 30 accounts for the first three years. So they've entrusted in us now, you know, in the brand. You, um, I'll jump in, Marcos. You mentioned um, you still have your other company, um, but it looks like you pulled some, some, some team members from there to help run this. In terms of, in terms of your focus, your time, uh, how much are you committing to this versus, I mean, obviously you've still got another company to run. Yes. Pedro, that's the number one question I get all the time. <laughs> the, so it's a family owned business. I've got 20 family members in that business. My cousin's the CEO, my wife's mother's, uh, you know, C, they all hold positions there and they run the business. So the last seven months, they've really allowed me to, to step away. Uh, I mean, I, I literally, I'm not even invited to the operations meetings anymore. <laughs> my name's on everything, but they run the show. They build it. It's we're growing at 300% year over year there. Uh, not that they don't need me, but they don't need me to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm there as a, as a thought leader for them and motivate them. Cause I'm a very positive guy. Uh, but the, the team is a team of five, me my co-founder, head of customer success, three internal software developers, front end, back end. And then we have a partnership with an agency, uh, but Javier, I mean, you got to talk to. All right, Marcos. Oh, you're muted, but. Ricardo, thanks uh, very much for being here. Hey, uh, you said you had 200 customers. Those 200 customers are from this platform, the software platform, cor correct? Can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about results? What are the yeah. results that your customers are seeing as a result of this? Yeah, so they're they're able, the number one thing that we've received is they're able to have a sales process organized. They're able to present a proposal faster than they've ever done. And especially for the newbies in the space that don't understand um, the industry and how to do walkthroughs, they're learning, right? So our walkthrough is a digital format of, an, of a building. So think of, you know, pictures to build a portrait of the space. Ricardo, sorry, but do you have like, you know, 50% see 10% growth, um, you know, some see, you know, 25%. I'm sorry, guys, growth. we're at time. We got to go on to the next team, but it was great. Maybe you can answer in chat over this. I'm sorry, but we are at time and it's time for us to um, introduce Latin Exchange and Margarita Moreno back to the TechRise stage. So welcome, Margarita. Hello. Okay, let me share my screen. We can see it. We just can't and see I'm you. Off camera, but here it goes. I should be on the camera now. Yeah. Yep. There you are. Okay. All right. So. One out of five Latinx educators leaves the teaching profession every year. That's 70,000 leaving the classroom this year. And that's because teachers usually spend seven hours per week searching for and five hours a week creating their own resources. And that's usually doubled for bilingual educators. So it's no wonder that 44% of all teachers leave by their fifth year. We're gonna change all that. We know from experience that teachers need culturally relevant resources, a strong sense of community, and professional growth opportunities yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so Latin Exchange is an online collaboration platform and marketplace where educators will find those bilingual resources, belong to a vast educational community network, and be compensated for the educational content they create. Our members and content creators will be the 3.5 million educators working in schools that serve 14 million Latinx students. And there are only 10% Latinx educators, but with our support, we're going to increase that. We're acquiring our members through our social media platforms, our podcast listeners, and the number one educator marketing method, word of mouth. And so we surveyed our fellow educators and 84% of them said that they need a platform for collaboration. And 46% said that they want to be the content creators for growth opportunities. And so we're currently getting ready to test our MVP when we have a group of about 100 educators ready with interest for summer learning options. The prize money from today will ensure that we have the opportunity to customize that platform to meet the needs of our members. 
When we're ready for scale, we know that the demand for the resources and the personalized professional development will be there. And we'll be ready to supply that through our community of educators who will provide those free resources and also the paid professional development opportunities. We know that there's competitors out there currently doing similar things such as Teachers Pay Teachers who provide resources and Coursera who provide learning opportunities. But our difference will be the integration of the services through an extensive marketplace of free bilingual resources and also our creation of the opportunities for educators to be the content creators and decision makers in education. We will generate our revenue from premium memberships, annual school site memberships and our own products and services too. Right now, schools pay a bilingual instructional coach to provide these two services, $75,000 a year, and they can only work with about six to eight educators at a time. Our platform will allow us to save schools tens of thousands of dollars and provide the resources and support to all of their teachers in one school. Our team has a collective of over 25 years of experience in education. Margarita Moreno, the founder and CEO, and Fabian Garcia is our co-founder and technology director, and Lucero Rodriguez is our social media producer. So we're all ready to disrupt the trend of teacher burnout and boost student achievement for 14 million Latinx students. Latin Exchange is ready to light the fuse that will change bilingual education forever. Thank you. All right, we can welcome the judges on and you can stop sharing your screen. Great pitch. Oh, sorry, Marcus. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Stephanie. Um, amazing pitch. Uh, my son is in a language immersion school, and so I can definitely see the need for this. Um, and it sounds like there are some, you know, exciting milestones just ahead for you. Uh, from your perspective, though, what are some of the biggest challenges you see in the next three to six months? I think it will definitely be in part the funding for the customization of our MVP and seeing where really the demand that our teachers are saying that they need. You know, we surveyed our educators already, but we want to really verify that. Besides that, it will be the time, right, and the resources to provide once we have more educators on the platform and that they're looking for all of those resources. So it all really does tie back a little bit into that initial funding that we have. And we currently are all putting our own money into this, of course. And so we know that it will take our blood, sweat, and tears, and we're ready to do whatever it takes to make sure that this is successful. Great. Uh, Margarita, thank you for that um, interesting opportunity. A marketplace for these resources is great. Any marketplace, you, one of the challenges is the liquidity of the supply. So when a teacher goes to the marketplace, will they be able to find sufficient material and resources there to keep them coming back? Um, how, how are you thinking about that? How are you gonna provide the initial uh, liquidity or supply of, of resources? Yes, so we're going to be creating our own, of course, uh, both myself and Lucero have been in the classroom and have already an extensive collection of our own resources that we've created, but we're really right now building that community through our other platforms such as um, TikTok or Facebook groups, there's educator Facebook groups, you know, that have up to 25,000 members. And then through Teachers Pay Teachers, you can see that there's a vast amount of free resources already. So our strategy really is going to bring in our members to our site, right? And they already come with those resources that are ready to be offered for free. And then it will be the creation of our own personal content that will go into the flow of the paid memberships and access to all of those other resources through the premium monthly memberships. Uh, my question is, I'd like to get a little more details on the business model. Um, you know, what do you, you mentioned paid memberships, premium memberships, uh, anything you can share on that in terms of like specifics? So right now we're still in growing from the idea into that explore phase as well, right? And we're looking at more or less the Canva model, uh, very similar to like teachers pay teachers, but extracting it over more into those free resources that are provided. And then that um, 
membership fee that will be uh, paid. We're really going to target the schools versus the educators. The educators will have the membership that they'll be paying in order to be able to sell, right? But the also the schools will be the ones who pay the annual memberships for the professional development and those growth opportunities, which every school has to provide their teachers with professional development every year and growth opportunities. They have a budget for that already. And we know that teachers want more customized growth. Right now they are sent to trainings that are the same trainings year and year and year. And they're like, why are we doing this? You know, and so we're really wanting to elevate the profession of teaching and rely on the knowledge that our educators already have to be able to train and support and mentor and grow our other teachers that are coming into the profession. Great. I think everyone got a question in, right? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much and great job, Margarita. Next, we have Sana Rai and we have Luis Suarez. Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Suarez, founder and CEO at Sanarai. I'm originally from Mexico City, came to the US to do my MBA at Duke University and met my now wife there. Upon graduating, I did three years of management consulting for a firm called Carney. And uh, we got married on March 14th. 2020. And if you remember, that was quite the eventful week and when we all realized the implications of the pandemic. That's where the idea comes from. What we're building, Sanarai, is an online platform that connects the Latinx community to mental health professionals in Latin America to provide culturally sensitive Spanish language emotional support at accessible prices. Only 5% of psychologists in the U.S. speak Spanish versus 13 of percent of the population that speaks Spanish at home. Treatment rates for Latinx are 10 percentage points below the average. Our solution makes it really easy to schedule sessions with mental health professionals at very affordable rates, and you can schedule a session tomorrow if you want to in the weekend. The opportunity is huge. Just in the US, more than 40 million people speak Spanish at home. That within itself is a $3 billion opportunity. But these services are very transferable in terms of language and geography. If we also count other languages in the US and Spanish speaking Latin, now we're talking about a $45 billion opportunity. We've already acquired customer in a variety of ways. So apart from direct to consumer, we partner with nonprofit organizations that offer our services to the families that they support employers that offer services to their employees, and mental health centers that are turning down people because A, these clients cannot afford their services, or B, they cannot serve them in Spanish. We've been out there for 10 months and have had great traction. We've had more than 500 sessions happen on our platform, 33% month over month revenue growth, people that try as low as and stay with us for a long time, and also recommend us. Our NPS score is really high for both individual users as well as organizations. There are three phases in us reaching our ultimate vision. Right now, we've been able to bootstrap and validate our MVP, and we are raising a pre-seed round that will allow us to become the brand that the Latinx trust their mental health with. We are going to generate more content and grow our audience to later make them become, or they can become a community of engaged users. And later on, we're gonna invest in technology that will also differentiate us. If we win today, we are gonna use the money to explore customer acquisition channels that we haven't been able to explore so far. For example, we want to partner with Spanish radio stations. We believe that we can become a multi-million dollar company in a couple of years by fulfilling our mission of increasing the access of the Latinx community to high quality mental health resources. Thank you. Great, so now we'll welcome the judges on stage for some questions. 
Yeah, Luis, thank you for being here. Uh, interesting uh, opportunity and idea. Mental health is, uh, uh, we've seen several companies out there doing some things in the space, not like what you're doing. So my question is, um, why, you know, why are you limiting the demand side to US Latinx? That's my impression of what you're doing. Or is this open to people that are in Latin America as well? Yeah, we have clients in Mexico already. Uh, part of the um, money that we're raising, we're going to be able to also charge Mexican pesos depending on where they uh, connect from. And yeah, we think the opportunity in LATAM is, is very big. Uh, the US is a step ahead in, in terms of mental health. So uh, we see a big opportunity going to LATAM as well. We think in the direct to consumer, it makes sense to start with the US just because of that wage arbitrage and, and we can make a compelling argument for the underinsured population. Uh, what's your rev share on the on the fees that are paid to the to therapists? Yeah, so we charge thirty five dollars. We keep ten dollars, and we pay them twenty five. So we're around thirty percent take rate. And I saw that you have six, or you're growing to six. That's one of your milestones in terms of the providers on the platform. Are they also all U.S. based, or are they globally distributed as well? They're all based in Mexico City for now, and we uh, plan to expand to other geographies. And if you have uh, therapists in the U.S. who are Latinx and want to be part of the supply side, are they? Are you marketing to them too, or just Latin America? Uh, further down the road, we want to offer different service levels. So we are offering the subclinical emotional support level that would be similar to a coaching service, but then we want to also offer other online therapy services with uh, people here in the US as well. Similar to what other prominent startups in the, uh, health, in the mental health space do like Lira Health or Ginger, that they have a tiered system. Great, well, thank you. I think that finishes us off. The judges have a lot to think about and I know a hard job, so, Good luck, guys. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce um, a couple of members from our community. We have um, Jaime Di Pablo Zosaya from the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And we also have Raul Rosas from um, the director of the Latinx Incubator. Real quickly, background on them. Jaime is the president and CEO of IHCC, um, whose mission is to cultivate knowledge, connections, and collaboration to affect tra transformational social change and achieve sustainable economic impact through entrepreneurship. Prior to that, um, Jaime was the executive director and CEO at Little Village Chamber of Commerce, and before that at the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce. And you're a commissioner at Illinois Latino Family Commission, and you're on the board of 1871, the Chicago Development Fund, and NIU's foundation board. So you're very involved. Thank you so much for being here. And then we have Raul. He's an entrepreneur and founder um, of several tech companies. He participated in the founder cohort of the Latinx Incubator and continues to work as an advisor, helping to develop startups that have emerged from the Latinx Incubator. You're also a venture partner at Republic along with me. So high five to that. Um, and uh, sorry, and for people that don't know, Republic is an investment platform um, focused on pre-seed and uh, series to series B equity crowdfunding. And you're an advisor to MicroCycle, one of our um, wonderfully female-led founder companies here in Chicago. So great to have you both. I know we're a little short on time, so I'm gonna just dive right into questions if that works for you all. But okay, so for people in the audience that don't know, the IHCC is a community of business owners, entrepreneurs, and professionals committed to empowering individuals by helping them start, grow, and grow their businesses. And as the largest community of Hispanic business owners across Illinois and the Midwest, the IHCC represents more than 70,000 businesses, which is incredible, and contribute, that contribute more than $15 billion to the state's economy and provides more than 100,000 jobs. So it's just, I think that most people don't realize the scale of the companies that you all work with, Jaime. I wonder if you could share a little bit of the background of the IHCC, kind of when it got started and then how people can get involved. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It is, it's very cool to see Latino companies pitch. Uh, it's very hard for feeling for me. Our mission at the chamber is to make sure every Latino company has the right tools and necessary equipment to grow their companies. And what's interesting, uh, and, the, and every Latino founder we see on the incubator is, is they're solving an issue that happened to them. So that's, that's very cool. Uh, and especially, you know, Luis Suarez and 
in Polly's group and, and, and you know, Seven Cubes and then Ricardo Regalado is, is an old friend and Javier, Javier uh, is a wonderful thing because it, we it, mental health is a big issue in our community. Uh, the chamber has been around 30 plus one years. Last year, we, we, you know, we kind of scratched our year off in terms of involvement in the community, but, but we were we actually pivoted. We, we went from seven full-time staff persons to 18. And then and Raul uh, is an external, but we've been very happy with Raul's work because uh, we became uh, sort of like rescuers of small businesses. We, we were able to get some funds and, and to, to help businesses to stay afloat with this mm-hmm. pandemic time. Uh, when the SBA talk about small businesses, they talk and focus on 500 employees or less. Well, Latinos, uh, if you have a 200 cup employee company, you consider a major company. Uh, and Latinos overall, 99% of Latino companies in the United States are 20 employees or less. So our job as a chamber is to make sure they get beyond that 20, understand why the reason why they don't grow, and then make sure they they, they, they become, uh, you know, they start growing or or you know, delivering services or opening up several pizzas. So our job is to make sure every Latino company in the state of Illinois succeeds. That's wonderful. Very I do have to, to sh- and we're thrilled to have you. And I have to share it with the group that, um, you know, part of the inspiration for Tech Rise comes from the Illinois Hispanic Chamber, because when I was starting Give Forward, the chamber gave me and my co-founder a $5,000 grant that we had a pitch competition and won. And $5,000 allowed us to do a little bit of marketing and buy t-shirts for one of the first races that we fundraised for. And it was the first external vote of confidence that made me feel like I could do this. And so I just want you to know that, you know, my personal journey very much has connections to the work that you all are doing. And it means a lot to have you here. Um, I do, Raul, want to give you a little bit of time to share about the Latinx incubator and how it grew out of the Hispanic chamber and, and kind of what your focus is. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thanks again for having us. Uh, the incubator is in partnership with 1871. So the, the focus is in Latinx and minority led startups. And it's really that initial and early vote of confidence into our founders. And I'd say about three quarters of them are early stage, are pre-revenue are figuring out what problem they're looking to solve. And that's really our positioning overall and being that bridge for early stage founders, early stage uh, entrepreneurs, Latino founders to break into the tech ecosystem here in the Midwest uh, and better identify and plug them into funding pipelines like we see here. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's an evolving ecosystem and it's great to be involved and seeing it evolve from my participation as in the first cohort to now uh, leading it. And we, we can't do it without all of our partners and supporters and similar to Tech Wrestle. Thank you. So I'm curious what you both think to this question. You know, I don't know the exact numbers for Latinos, but I know that in Chicago, we've only had two Latinas raise over a million dollars, I believe, or maybe that's changed now this year, but it's still, a, a, you know, pathetically small number. And then, you know, similar to what you shared, Jaime, about, you know, how many businesses kind of max out at 20 employees. I'm wondering, what do you think needs to change for our community and by our community to better scale these businesses so that we can have more success stories and have, you know, sure, unicorns are great, but like, we also need sustained scale in order to create more tech jobs and and more wealth. And so I'm curious, what you two see well, as the, the, the number one thing I teach businesses, uh, Latino businesses, is to learn how to use other people's money. Uh, and I think that's the key to success of any business. Uh, if you understand that concept, I think sky is the limit. Uh, but it's very difficult as Latinos, immigrants that came to this country with a dream and with it, it's very difficult to understand that. They, they usually let it all ride. And if, if business goes wrong, then goes the house, then goes the college fund, right? So they need to, we need to understand to use other people's businesses and collaborations with you know local chambers around town and whatever you are is key to that because businesses, small, you know, I talked about about 20 employee businesses. Well, small businesses are too busy running a business. And when an opportunity comes, they, they, they left out because of running a business. So having a having relationships with the Chamber of Commerce around your area is key to help you get those funds you need to, to, to expand and survive. Yeah, and, and adding to that, I'd say uh, wrapping as an operator and, and business owner, wrapping your head around uh, sometimes needing to go a little slower slower to, to work on the processes, to work on the operations, to be able to grow faster and be able to do things more efficient. I, th- I think it's that concept of 
going a little slower right now because it doesn't feel like you're go, go, go working and building on the business, but as opposed to then being able to set the right processes and, and pro- procedures in place to be able to grow and scale. Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of your answers. And I think that whether you know it's first generation or many generations deep into being you know here in the US, there culturally, I think we we share this thought that we need to do all the work all the time and that we you know the idea of using other resources and other people's money to grow our businesses can sometimes feel foreign or it feels potentially like a handout. And and I do think that we need to change the narrative on that, right? Like we're giving people an opportunity to invest in our businesses and they get an upside when we grow. And that has a huge impact and a ripple effect across our community. So. Yeah. I mean, just to add, we, we have issues trying to fundraise money to, to even implement Latinx incubator. And and it shouldn't be an issue. I mean, people should be throwing money at us. Look at the scale of these companies you see here. And and it's it's an issue. And and we just had to change the paradigm. You know, that's, that's how it is. I agree. And, you know, the Latinx community alongside other, you know, marginalized communities, I think is at an interesting year, right? Where we, the, the social justice movement has been so focused and, and as it should be on what has been happening with black and African-American community members. And I'm wondering if you see this as an opportunity for the Latinx community to finally get some of the visibility that it, it should be getting in the startup ecosystem, or if you think potentially that it was it took more of the, the funds and resources than, than were able to be shared across the board. I think it could go either way. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Hopefully that's not yeah. too controversial of a topic. Yeah. No. For, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'd say it's a, it's a bit of a mix. Um, it, I mean, there's always going to be a need. There's always going to be a need for all communities that are underestimated and, and marginalized. As it relates to the Latinx community and the Latinx incubator, we're seeing some of those early successes of those early votes of confidences in some of our earlier startups in earlier cohorts. And now we're seeing that return on investment of that time, whether it's uh, building a business and having more employees or raising capital or being profitable or even exiting. We're seeing some of those early successes and the more that we see it the more we're going to have people interested in investors willing to take that additional risk and be a little bit riskier with, with their capital to be able to invest in our founders. And it's just get cutting that red tape and cutting the check. I agree. I also think it's the job of every successful Latinx founder or business owner to reach back and make sure you're pulling people along with you. You know, angel investing is starting to grow in our community, but it's not growing fast enough. And the risk aversion is very high as we know. So I just really wanna encourage those of us who have made it to think about how we can invest our time, our network and our resources in 100%. our, you know. Yeah. Okay, so we're at time. So the judges are coming on to announce the winner. Thank you guys both for your time. Sorry, it was so truncated today. Um, And then also, please, founders, join us on the stage here, video on, audio on. It looks, Stephanie, are you going to announce the winner? Okay, wonderful. Hey, let's wait till everyone gets to go. I know Marcos had another meeting that was right at the hour. So sorry, you're going to miss it, but it's recorded. We'll send you the video. All right. we were pretty much at a deadlock. This was really hard. Um, there were so many things to love about so many of you. Um, in the end, we decided to award the prize to Margarita of Latin X Exchange. Um, we're really excited for what you're doing um, for educators and definitely see the opportunity. Uh, we see challenges too. And so, you know, you've got a road ahead of you, but we're, you know, really excited. Um, to offer this to you. And we want to know, there was a lot of interest in several of you. So we want to stay connected. Uh, We want to, you know, to keep the conversation going uh, with you all, be a resource for you. Um, So just want to commend everyone um, who pitched here today. Good job. Margarita, do you want to say a few words? (laughs) I'm a little speechless right now, but just really thank you. Well, yes, and thank you so much to our judges and to our brave competitors who came on stage. And as you know, it's this is not one and done. You're welcome back. And this is actually Margarita's second time on stage. So I want you to know that you can come back on and win and it definitely can happen. So congratulations to everyone who's here. Your businesses are clearly off to an amazing start or very far along and ready to keep scaling. Um, and judges, thank you so much for making the time. Um, 
Hi, Main Raul, thank you for making the time. And then a special thanks, of course, to Verizon for making this all possible. We also have several additional sponsors that are coming on over the next few weeks that I would I will happily share with you all, but I want to put a special thanks to um, Valor Equity Partners who has made a really meaningful contribution that allows us to increase our prize money every week to 20,000. So um, thank you all, have a wonderful weekend. Hopefully you'll go in feeling inspired. And for those of you who are watching with an idea, please come on stage and apply for TechRise. It's techrise.co slash apply. You just have to have an idea. You don't even have to have a website built yet. So just come on. We're ready to give you $20,000. All right. Have a great weekend, everyone. And thank you again. Thanks, everyone. And congratulations, Marita. Thank you. Yeah. Same here.